Let me just uh, read a couple of verses of Scripture uh, for you this morning out of Isaiah chapter 6, beginning with verse 6. Then one of the seraphs flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. 
Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me. Father, we thank you this morning that there were so many that you sent to share the love of Christ with those in San Francisco. And Father, I pray your word that uh, in what you did in our lives there, that it will touch the hearts of people here. God, we thank you for the uh, opportunity to be able to worship you, to uh, come before you this morning. I pray for those who are dealing with struggles, hardships, and difficulties. God, that they will experience your presence this morning in a fresh and new way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. A lot of you know what I've gone through in the last, uh, the last while. Three years ago, I left, lost my oldest brother. In April, I lost my third oldest brother. A month ago, I lost my fourth, fifth oldest brother. And then two weeks after that, I lost my second oldest brother. And um, it's very hard, but you know that sometimes when you have a lot of people in your family, you're going to have a lot of heartache. And um, it's just part of life. But I wanted to talk about this, the way the Lord comforted us, comforted us in the last, in this particularly last loss. Um, my brother Ashley and my sister-in-law Alice were on their way to their son's wedding in Galveston when a drunk driver blacked out and fell over the wheel, causing him to careen into my brother and sister-in-law's car killing Ashley and injuring his wife, Alice. I believe it was Ashley's time to go, but I want you to know about the ways that God showed us his comfort and the several ways he prepared for us. Um, most of us were on the way to the wedding when we received the call, and because we we're already nearby, we were able to gather quickly to comfort his children. My sister-in-law was hurt, but not terribly, and she survived. Her daughter and son-in-law were supposed to ride with them, but changed their minds, wanting to leave a little bit later. My nephew's friends were there as attendants at his wedding, so they were on hand to give him comfort and support. One drove him to the accident site as soon as they got the message, and of course, the wedding didn't take place. But um, Christopher, my nephew, who was to exchange vows that day with his beloved Amy, was the first to find out, and the way he found out is because some woman on the scene found Alice's purse, looked inside, found Chris's number and called his cell phone. She could have taken off with the purse. Instead, she cared enough to contact a stranger to let him know his parents were in an accident. And then a woman we didn't even know who was staying at a motel across the street from the hotel crossed the street to the accident scene and administered chest compressions on my brother. She's an Aryan and her name is Misty. We found that out because she called the hospital to check on my brother and accidentally called the room and my niece was in there and managed to talk with her. But a few days after the accident, which was in Galveston, my youngest brother, who lives in Austin, was talking to my niece and told her the strangest thing that one of his Facebook friends had posted about the accident and that she had been in Galveston and had done chest compressions on the victim and her name was Misty. And I don't believe any of those things that happened were coincidences. I believe God had prepared each circumstance to bring us comfort when it was Ashley's time to go. And I believe those are miracles. And I just wanted to share that because if anyone else experiences loss in the coming days, I want you to know that you can find comfort knowing that he's also preparing a way for you to find peace and comfort in your time of sorrow. Thank you. Church, it's time for us to pray and ask God's blessing on this family. Ask God's blessings on other families who are struggling and things like that. When Mary Beth called me and asked if she could have this opportunity, it seemed to fit very well with the fact that we're doing testimonies today. We're talking about how God has showed up big time and where he's shown a big time. And we should expect that, not be surprised when it happens. So we're going to take a minute, and we're going to stand together, we're going to join hands across these aisles, because that's what families do. They join hands and they love one another, in good times and bad. So let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you today that we can rest in confidence, whether our seasons are good or bad 
that you're in control. We thank you for Mary Beth's testimony today, for the faithfulness you showed in her life. And so, Lord, as, as her church family, we're coming today lifting her up and asking you to show her family comfort and peace, and, Lord, to use us to do it. Help us, Lord Jesus. Help us to seek out those who have walked through the dark seasons, who have walked through the valleys, and to wrap our arms around them. And in doing so, we're wrapping yours around them as well. We pray that you would speak powerfully in this service today, that you would use us, Lord Jesus, those who will offer testimonies, that you would show yourself mighty and awesome and powerful in this place. And so that when we go out of here, Lord, when we go to our, our homes, back to school, back to businesses, we do it with the confidence that you, Lord, you are where we are. That's what you promised. Speak to us in this time of worship, Lord Jesus. We love you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. In our business to adopt each building, meaning having a consistent team of five or six, whatever the number would be, of people going there weekly, starting Bible studies, praying with people. And so, so far we have 20 adopted buildings in the, so in the beginning process. So what it looks like really what you guys will be kind of in, taking and helping serve alongside today is we'll have about 100 volunteers come in from 2 to 5, start a 2 of worship, they'll have someone give some message from the Word, and then we'll send you guys out and just help serve alongside, praying with people, passing out food. Fun. All right. Hey, thank you, man. I appreciate it. Yeah. All right. Do three things before you get here. Pray, pray, and then pray some more. Because you're gonna you're gonna see things you're not prepared to see. You're gonna hear stories you're not gonna be ready for. Yeah, the tenderloin is uh, less than one square mile. Thirty-seven thousand people live here. It has the highest crime rate, uh, the most poverty, the most homelessness uh, in all of San Francisco. So. Uh, and just about 35 blocks, you have 37,000 people that live here. And so the Tenderloin is uh, what we describe as broken. It's very broken. It's a lot of addiction, a lot of pain, a lot of trauma in people's lives that has led to addiction. So you just have a lot of people that are in pretty desperate situations. I'm so thankful, God, to be a part of your work here in the Tenderloin. Uh, we just reflect on all the people, God, that are here, God, that live here day in and day out, God. Father, the brokenness that we see here every day, Father, the people trapped in their addictions, God, trapped in their isolation, Father, we ask as we go out, Father, your power will go with us, God, that you will open doors, God, that you will open hearts today. So, Father, we bless you today, God, here. We just want to start, God, by acknowledging who you are, God, in this place, in this district, and in this city. So, Lord, we ask that you'll hear us, God, here from the ten more today. I'm a pastor. Uh, my name is Randy Wilson, and we are with LifePoint Church. We are uh, planting a new, a new church startup for the sake of reaching the city in San Francisco. Um, I'll tell you, uh, where we're located is uh, right in the heart of the city, um, in the very center of the city, in an area called Castro Noe Valley. Uh, we, we believe that uh, we are called to, uh, to plant a church in those targeting neighborhoods, not targeting people. Uh, of certain age groups or certain types, but uh, geographically being the church. We believe one thing about the church uh, that's clear in the scripture is that the church uh, makes sense only when people that are diverse in every uh, nation and nationality and age group come together um, around the central purpose of not being friends, but around the central purpose of uh, knowing Jesus Christ and following Him and choosing to be obedient to Him. And so uh, that's what we've moved here uh, for, is to be a part of the work that God's already doing here in the city. God, I thank you for the work of this ministry, and thank you for the, uh, the staff that's here, and for their leadership and their love for you. And Father, I thank you for the mission teams that have been here before us and are now, and will come after us. I pray that you'll uh, help us this week, especially as a team, that you work in our hearts in ways that have been different than what we ever thought. And Lord, I just pray that you'll continue to use each uh, team that comes. Uh, God, that you would do a work that uh, can only be attributed only to you. So we, uh, we give you this ministry. We thank you for City Impact and for the difference it's making here in Jesus' name. Well, everyone, this is our team that we sent to San Francisco. There were 21 of us 
all together. We went with a twofold purpose. One was to work with Randy Wilson, who was the pastor of the new church start that we're partnering with, Life Point. We went to assist and, and be with him. And we also went to work with a ministry called City Impact. There are about six ministries that the team's going to share about that we had a chance to be involved with during the week. Opportunities for us to minister uh, to homeless people that are there in that area of the Tenderloin. So we thank you for supporting us uh, through your prayers and through fi uh, your finances. And uh, so this morning, we just wanted to make this very casual. Our team is just going to uh, share about what God did uh, in their lives during certain things. Tam's going to begin with us. We have, they have a school that's there, and so she's going to share. And then let me mention to other team members, if there's something you would like to say that as well, we'll just pass the microphones down and let you do that. Okay, Tam? Good morning. Uh, a few weeks before we left for San Francisco, Darren sent out a couple of emails. And in his email, he said, now I want you to be thinking about why you're going to San Francisco. Because at some point during the week, I'm going to ask you to tell me why you're going to San Francisco. I'm going to ask you to tell the group why you went to San Francisco, why you're doing this mission trip. He didn't realize what a probing question that was for me. Because initially, when I planned this trip, Gary and I were going to go together. And it was going to be his first mission trip. And hopefully the first of many. But Gary died last fall. And I was left trying to put things back together. Do I go? Why am I going? I don't know. Should I go? It's not good enough to go because I want to fulfill his dream. It's not good enough to go to try to get some sense of closure for me. I didn't know why I was going. But God assured me as I searched and I prayed for the answer that I was to go on this trip. There was a reason. I didn't know what it was. I was like the driver at night following those headlights. I just went as far as I could see, and that's all I could do. And so I went. On Sunday, we, visited, we um, worshipped with City Impact. And during the time of greeting, like we do in our church, I turned around to the ladies behind me and introduced myself, and they said, oh, we're teachers at the school. And uh, they said, what, what do you do? Well, you know, just chit-chatting. And I said, I'm a math teacher. And they said, no way! This week, we're doing an emphasis in mathematics, and you're, you could help us. We really don't know what we're doing. Could you, really, could you help us? Tell them that you're a math teacher, and they'll put you in the school. Well, here's the thing, y'all. We didn't even know we were going to be able to work in the school. Had no idea going that we were going to be able to work in the school. And I began to feel so excited. My heart beat just a little bit faster because I began to realize why I went on this trip. God had a plan for me, and that plan was in that little school, that little private school at City Impact. Well, I know I only had three minutes, and I've already taken those, but I will be quick now. Uh, we got started. The first day was kind of um, disappointing. We didn't get to do what we thought we were going to get to do, and we didn't get to work as much with the children. We were a little bit disappointed. But the second day, things picked up, and they began to realize what this group to do. Take a look at this group. If you're a teacher, would you just kind of wave? <laughs> you know, God put together an amazing team for this trip. So as we began to realize the scope of what they needed regarding mathematics, I looked around, and I had a couple of principals with me. I looked around. I had preschool teachers. I had an instructional strategist with me. I had a high school teacher who kept us very well grounded and told us that if we had walked into her classroom, she would have been terrified and wondered what she had done wrong. So anyway, as, and then we had our secret weapon. 
Chelsea Best. Chelsea is uh, finishing her program at Stephen F. Austin. She is the newest of the teachers among us, and uh, she knew all of the most current methods of teaching. We had a blast. We got into that school. They finally trusted us to get down into their uh, basement. Judy Terry, you would have thought you had died and gone to heaven. <laughs> There were so many things down there. We found geoboards. We found uh, all kinds of uh, geometric designs. We found calculators. We found measuring devices. We found manipulatives out the wazoo. We found all kinds of things. You see, we thought we were going to have to go shopping and find stuff to put together some boxes. This is what they wanted us to do. They wanted us to put together math boxes so that they could help teach the concepts that they were supposed to be teaching. And yet, they didn't realize what they had, and they didn't realize what their standards were in the state of California. So we pointed them to the standards, we got together and we put together math boxes, and we had a ball doing it. And the day that we showed our teachers the math boxes that we put together, they cried. And we knew that God had used us in a special way. The morning that we did get to actually go into one of the classrooms, Mary Sue and I were in a kindergarten classroom, which is our home away from home, and we were learning about China that week. That's how they had organized their summer school program. They were learning about a different country each week, and that week was China. And I'm sorry I don't have a recording of this little East Texas girl trying to count to 10 in Chinese. It was a hoot. But we had a good time with the children. Um, they were painting, as I say. We were trying to learn to count to, chi to 10 in Chinese. But it was hard to sit with those precious children and not think about their home, the place where they lived, and the things that went on excuse me, around them each day. And you'll hear more about that as you hear about the street ministry. But then the thought comes to you. They're in a school where every day they're told Jesus loves you, where every day they're told Jesus died for you, and Jesus wants you to come live with him in heaven someday, no matter where your earthly home is now. So I am so thrilled that I got to be with those children that morning, and I'm so thrilled that my church cared enough about them to send me to San Francisco. We worked in other areas of the school, and Mary Sue's going to share a little bit about that with you now. When I was a kindergarten teacher, the first thing when, when you start out the door is you have to line up. That's just what you do, and you really want them in a straight line, and you really want them to be quiet so they can listen to you. But guess what their first thing they talked about? Children, you need to walk on the streets looking down to make sure that you're not walking into something very dirty. They're teaching life skills. That was real. People lived on the streets. You never knew what was what you were going to walk on when you were walking in the streets. That was very important to them. That was a day-to-day -day affair that they needed to know about. And the teacher was reminding them who cared if they were talking and who cared if they were in a straight line. They needed to know a life skill, and, and they learned it. Also, I got to work in the office. I thought it would kind of be like the office that I came from. Well, it wasn't. When the children came in um, to ask a question from one of the administrators or a teacher that happened to be in the office, they just bypassed the receptionist. They walked over to who they wanted to talk to, leaned on the desk, and you know, moved all around, touched their things, and it was okay. And I didn't realize till after I had spent the week at City Impact that that was what they needed because, see, they were teaching relationships. They were teaching them about families. Those people knew everything about their family. They asked about them, even if they were supposed to be in class. If those kids don't feel safe and loved, they're not going to be able to learn. That's what they were doing, a very simple thing of allowing them to chit-chat with the administrator or the teacher and after a little while, she finally said, you know, you really have to go back to class. And that's what they needed to hear. On this trip, um, 
one of the things we learned is that it's all about relationships and um, investing in people's lives. And uh, there was a man by the name of Ben and uh, went around and introduced myself. And I said, hey, I see you're here by yourself. And he said, I'm actually not here by myself. He said, my friend's at the door and he doesn't have a dollar to get in. And so I paid his dollar so he could come in. And uh, his name was Dan. And we, we visited and he came every day to the soup kitchen. And so especially the days that I was there, obviously I got to visit with him, but I did ask the other people that were working in the soup kitchen when I wasn't there. And they said he was there. He also told me that he worships regularly on Sundays and he wasn't feeling good the Sunday that we were there. So therefore I didn't see him on Sunday, but he was there every day. And uh, they were trying to get him to, to volunteer because they have a program where they can take the homeless people and, and step them up and they start helping out and so forth. And I think Diana might share a little bit about that, I think. So um, Tuesday night, uh, Darren and I were out doing street ministry and we met a guy by the name of Otis. And uh, Otis was a, 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 neat, a neat man and we took him and uh, uh, I bought him a, it was kind of scary, went in this, I told him I'd buy him a meal and uh, this was in the evening. And uh, so he walks back in the little convenience store, and I thought he was going to grab something he shouldn't have grabbed because um, I wasn't going to buy that, if you know what I'm talking about. But uh, he just wanted a bottle of water, and uh, we got him some, uh, I think it was a Hot Pocket that first day. And I invited him to come to the soup kitchen. He was there the next day. And uh, so, therefore, that opened that door, and I saw him several times. I was able to work with him and Dino to help him get a uh, clothing voucher. He was a big dude like me, and uh, they were able to take care of him and so forth. And then one of the things that really uh, impacted me was Thursday night doing street ministry. Uh, Steve and I met um, two gentlemen, and um, unfortunately, I cannot think of the second guy's name, but the first guy that we talked to, his name was Alex. And um, you're going to hear us all say this about the homeless people, that they're not any different from us. They just don't hide anything, and they will tell you everything that's going on in their lives. And, and so I asked Alex, and we were handing out the chips and stuff, um, I asked if I could pray for him. And he said that, you know, he said, I messed up too bad, and I, you know, went over and over, and uh, things went on, and we, we talked for a good 45, 30, 45 minutes or so forth, and I got to share the gospel with him, and uh, he still had just a ton of questions and so forth. And then that Friday morning was when we went to Life Point. And so I went back Friday afternoon, and there he was. There was Alex, and he just was full of questions about um, um, his relationship with God and so forth, and just thought that he was way too messed up and so forth, and uh, and so forth. But it was it was great to see him there. They had told me that he was there that morning looking for us and so forth. So. Um, my time in the soup kitchen, obviously, we got to serve several meals. The, they had chicken, and when I say they had chicken, they had a ton of chicken. They fed them fish every night, um, several vegetables, salad, things like that. I mean, they fed them very, very well. Dinner, we actually served them. They didn't come get the food and, and so forth. So it was a humbling experience feeding or uh, serving the homeless there. But um, for me, just the investment of time with the homeless people. And then on top of that, we were there, obviously, with some other churches, and our teams were split up. We weren't all in the soup kitchen at the same time and so forth, and there were other churches, and getting to work with some people of different denominations. And then also, um, there was, a, couple, there was a, a brother and a sister that came over from one of the areas of San Francisco. They were there every day. And just to, worship, or to, to help serve the homeless and get the meals ready and, and, and do those things and to visit with those people and uh, meeting some of the people from the other, other churches and so forth, meeting this cup, um, these, this brother and sister and, and just understanding. It was just such a awesome thing working together for the same goal. And um, so the soup kitchen was definitely a very much a blessing for me. Uh, David was a guy that I was ministering to and he was, uh, had served six years in the U.S. Navy. And he had said that he uh, never drank or did drugs until the last two years of his service. And uh, so he was ex expressing to me about how disappointed he was in the drugs that he had done over the weekend because he spent all this money and he wasn't able to get high. So I said, uh, asked him, I says, well, uh, have you ever thought about trying God? He says, you know, and he looked at me and I said, you know, God could put you on a trip that you could get so high that, that you don't, can't believe you're really that high. I said, and it's free. <laughs> so you know, that's what he mentioned to me that Kyle, one of the volunteers from City Impact, was working with him on Sundays because Sunday would come 
uh, on Sundays he would come to adopt a building, which Kim will explain to you about that later. And uh, anyway, he we did pray and we and we talked, and so he left. And I st I'm still praying for him because you know God is a trip. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and we do get high off his love, and, and he does love us. V refers to his kitchen as the Holy Spirit kitchen. Um, he can have a need, and he speaks to it about God, and the next thing you know, uh, it's provided. One day, I said something about having salad, and he said, oh, no, we never get salads in here, uh, fixings for salad. But uh, the next day, or before we left, we had salad, and V was so surprised when we saw that food come in. I also worked with uh, a young lady who's a student at SFA. Her name was Madeline, um, and she was just volunteering out there for the summer. Um, one thing that um, I thought about after we got home is, um, you know, as we were passing out the chips today, we may have asked you, how are you doing? Everybody says fine or okay. The folks that you meet on the street in the Tenderloin are so open, as we've said. They tell you what's going on with them. They're, there's um, no, they don't put up any facade, and you have something that you can pray with them about. They're just open to hearing you pray. And another thing that dawned on me um, that I thought about after uh, second grade Sunday school and after Kobe's message is these folks on the street, they don't have friends, they don't have family that can offer support to them. And we're so blessed by family and friends with, and with Jonathans and Jonathanettes. Um, we're just so truly blessed. I thought I was ready to go to California, but I was not prepared for this. When we got there, we'd get instructions on what to do. The number one thing they said is, show these people respect. They need somebody to show them that they're important, that they have a worth. And we'd separate clothes, hang clothes up, do all kinds of things like that, wait on customers. We did something that I really enjoyed doing was they'd give us a list from one of the other places would send the list down they would say, we need to get clothes for these people. And sometimes the person was there, sometimes they weren't. And you'd get a bag of clothes and give to them. We go to Walmart and get $20 worth of clothes and we carry them home and put them in a closet with hundreds more dollars worth of stuff and forget this is all that person has in the world was that little sack you gave them. I was very humbled to get to work with those people because they showed respect to the homeless, they showed respect to everybody that they dealt with, and that was a wonderful thing. Two other things I'd like to bring up. One was, it was a little shocking to me, I never waited on a person as old as I was. They're all dead. Nobody else was in their 60s. I never saw anybody my age the whole time I was there. The other thing that I wanted to bring up was I am so proud, and I think Central Baptist should be so proud of the young adults who showed people God loved them. We owe this group a tremendous thanks. They did wonderful. Um, adopt a building is a program that City Impact started in order to reach the people of the Tenderloin. Um, most, of uh, many of the residents of this area in San Francisco live in buildings called SROs. We, they threw this term around several times and finally I googled it um, because I don't like not knowing things. An SRO stands for Single Resident Occupancy. There are, uh, later when we got home I looked again, it said 5% of San Francisco ooh, of their residents live in SROs, and they estimated about 30,000 people, and I believe there's about 37,000 that live in the Tenderloin. Um, all the SROs are not located in the Tenderloin, but the vast majority of them are. So a huge number of the residents that live in the Tenderloin live in these one room, half the size of many of your dorm rooms is where they live. Um, there are a lot of rules and regulations set up. Um, most of the buildings have social workers on site um, to help them process their paperwork, their, um, 
I'm going to go history for just a second here. Uh, the, a lot of the SROs were built after the earthquake and fire of San Francisco in 1906, 1907. And they're initially just a temporary housing situation, just get folks a roof over their head. Then the city realized it was a good place to put immigrants as they came into the country. So we're going to use it for that. Then it kind of moves on where when other cities were tearing down their SROs, San Francisco realized it was a great place to put people right out of prison. People who were mentally unable to live completely on their own, but with some supervision. Let's put them in these buildings. Um, people who were coming out of drug rehab programs but needed a place to go. Let's put them in these buildings. Um, homeless people, if you're trying to get off the streets and into a house, we're going to put you in an SRO. So these are not necessarily fully functioning, healthy people ready to be on their own. City Impact said the number one issue that they deal with is isolation. Um, and we all know that. It's not good for us. Why do we come here on Sundays? Why do we worship as a group? Because we feed off each other. Um, we grow in our Christian strength from other Christians. Um, and these guys are living in these single homes by themselves, isolated. They have folks, people that um, live in the buildings of City Impact that work there full time. Um, they have other people who volunteer during the week. Adopt a building is you. It's people who have jobs, nine to five jobs, um, and this is your time of ministry. You go to church on Sunday mornings, and after church is over, you come down to the Tenderloin to City Impact, you get your food, whatever we're going to hand out for the day, and then you go visit your building. They stay with the same building over and over again. And as we've said repeatedly, it's all about building relationships, making those connections. They take fruit. Um, I think the Sunday we were there, we handed out fruit. Um, it's not about the food. It's, that's just what gets that door open. Um, my dad picked me up from the airport when we came back from the trip, and his first question was, how evangelical are they? City impact. And I said, well, let me put it this way. If someone shows up and their arm has fallen off, they're going to say, let me tell you about Jesus, and then we're going to sew your arm back on. Um, <laughs> they are serious about spreading the word of Christ, and it is awesome. It's the first time I grew up in a Christian home. Um, I was saved. I was baptized when I was seven. I was saved when I was 23. And never in my life have I spoke more about Christ. Hold on. Never in my life have I spoke more about Christ in one concentrated time. And it was awesome. You knock on the door. They know you're coming. We would walk down the street as a group, and the people on the street would start yelling, here come the Christians. How awesome is that? <laughs> um, not City Impact, or there's the church people. Here come the Christians. We do so much in our community for other people. And we do it through Central Baptist Church. Or we do it, but we never do it. I'm sorry, I will say I. I don't say, I, the only reason I'm here knocking on this door today is because Jesus loves me. And I want to tell you about it. I don't say that. I give a shirt out. I give a pair of pants out. And they say, why are you doing this? Oh, my church is doing this. Central Baptist Church is doing this. And we give the honor to this building. Through City Impact, I learned that I'm going to give the honor to Christ every single time. And that's a big change for me. That's something new I'm going to try out. Um, I was with three groups, I mean, three, other, three guys. First door knocked on, Wanda opens the door. Wanda opens the door, and Adam was our group leader, and he immediately starts talking. Hey, how's it going, Wanda? How's your daughter? Did you get your cats taken care of? Um, did you like the picture that we sent last time? You know, the, the, there's an immediate interaction. They're friends. They're friends. And then he says, how are you? One of the rules of adoptability, I don't know if you guys told you this, but you say, how are you? Um, we talked about this earlier. You say, how are you doing? Fine. And you walk on. Not there. <laughs> They're not messing around. How are you? And if they give you a fine, we were instructed to wait a few minutes, ask it again. What's God done for you this week? How did Jesus impact your life? You remember, they remembered what they prayed for. It wasn't a simple, I'm going to pray for you. And then they forgot. They prayed and then they asked about it. How was it? So Wanda's talking and she's telling us that her daughter got a house and that was really awesome and that was a praise because it was something they'd been praying for for many weeks. So that was awesome. So I got to see that and hear that. And then he asks, what can we do for you this week? And he pulls his phone out and he starts getting on his phone and I'm like, oh, that's rude. Um, and Wanda's talking and the other guys that are with us, we're all kind of talking and he's still looking on his phone and she had mentioned that she had laundry to do. Um, Wanda is a, a, is it agoraphobic? You're afraid to leave your house? Yeah. Yeah, agoraphobic. Um, she has managed now to leave her apartment, but she can't leave her building. And so it's very difficult for her to do something as simple as her laundry. 
Um, it, he looks at her and he's talking, talking, talking. They're talking, sorry. He's looking at his phone. And all of a sudden he goes, okay, here. And he shows her what he'd been looking at was his day planner on his phone. And he says, Tuesday night I can be here at 6 o'clock. Does that work for you? Now, Wanda, when you open the door, there was a smell coming out of that room. You don't want to go in there. Don't want to be in there. This young man is probably 33, 34 years old, professional, I'm sure had a hundred other things he could have done on Tuesday night at 6 p.m., but I promise you, Tuesday night at 6 p.m., he was with Wanda doing her laundry. How fascinating. How awesome is that? I got to experience just almost all of the ministries that um, City Impact is involved in, and it's a whole lot. And I'm sure there's some that we really didn't see. I got to work in the office of the school one day um, and then do some uh, future lesson planning that I'll be sending to them for science lessons um, in a couple of weeks um, to get them ready for their fall. Uh, the thrift store, the um, food bank, um, the kitchen of the food bank, or the kitchen of the rescue mission. Um, but out of everything that I did, I even cooked, and those of you who know me know I'm not a cook. Um, but uh, out of everything that we did, the thing that pulled me out of my comfort zone the most was street ministry. And the day that I was going to do that um, was challenging. And I prayed Second Corinthians 12, 9, for he has said to me, my power is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I will, I will boast about my weakness, that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Because um, just walking up to somebody and talking to them, I can do that with teenagers. But on that street, I was scared to death. I was truly scared. And the street ministry probably was the thing that touched my heart the most. We started out with bags of chips. We each had lots of bags of chips. They were big bags. They were, um, I think they were a test chip from Frito-Lay. And one was, they were Doritos, and one was like red and yellow and green, I believe. And one was hot, one was hotter, and one was fire. <laughs> and I like hot stuff, but it was fire. I mean, you knew you'd eaten that Dorito an hour later. Um, and we were giving this to people who didn't have any teeth. Um, because of drugs and things like that. Um, as Nick said, you didn't see very many older people on the street. They don't survive. Um, and we went out to minister to people who, um, some of them probably hadn't had a bath in a while, a long while. Um, they weren't real clean. Uh, their background was nothing like mine. And yet, they were one of God's kids. As much as the children that worship in those two wings over there, the kids over in the rock that I get to love on on Sundays, um, and the kids that go to the Sunday school classes back off the main foyer, as much as... All of us are God's kids. They're God's kids. And he called us there to love them. And that's what we went out to do. We ended up in kind of a triangle position where we had a woman and two guys to the left of us, and then three adolescent males, probably 18, on this side of us. And then so Lori and Chelsea start playing Frisbee like that's normal because we're trying to figure out who we're going to talk to. So I just said, I'm going to pray. I'm going to just figure out who the Lord wants us to talk to. In the meantime, this little group over here had a dog with them that they were playing fetch with. He was probably about 12, 12 weeks old. And all of a sudden, the dog t brings a stick, and he runs over to me, and I'm 50 feet away and drops a stick on my floor. I'm on my feet. I'm like, okay, God, that was pretty good. <laughs> Pick up the stick. The dog's name Shadow, and I raised my hand. I was like, hey, you know, Shadow left his stick. Can I bring it back? And I said, sure. So I walk over there and sit down with these people. And it was so awesome because I'm trying to be normal, like, so, hey, what's going on? Because <laughs> they were doing drugs, y'all. They were really doing drugs. And here comes my little friends with their lunch sack. Hi, we have a picnic. And we all sit down. 
it, it was just so abnormal from what's happening right here. And um, another gentleman comes out of nowhere, and he's JISD uniform ready. Like, you know what he looks like, tucked in, ready to go. And we think he's a, a missionary, too. Like, he's on target with us. And he actually, he was, he was looking for drugs. So they run over the bit bushes, and they exchange stuff. And then they come back, and we start talking. And it's a pretty great conversation, really. And then the girl finally says to us, hey, you guys, you want a bowl? You, in a bowl, is, there's marijuana in it. <laughs> and it was like, okay, we're supposed to share lunch. Do we need to do? <laughs> Does anyone see Darren? <laughs> and it was so, because the best answer ever, kids, is you say, no thanks, but we don't mind if you do. That's what Chelsea said. And it was really great. And you could feel the air. And we just, we had an awesome conversation for about an hour and a half. <laughs> um, from that conversation, some of the things we learned is that, home, that that group in that area call themselves people that live outside as opposed to homeless. So there implies some bit of a choice. And there was also some snobbery in terms of living outside in this park versus living outside in the Tenderloin. If there, was like, there was a discrepancy between the two. And what this group, what we found in, in them was that there was a real care for each other. There was communities. There was... Um, they knew who was safe, they knew who wasn't safe, they actually had a culture of uh, finders keepers. If you find something that's new and that's a tourist, you can keep it. If it's old and beat up, that means that's one of our people and you have to work really hard to find them and you have three days. After three days you don't find them, you get to keep it. The other thing that was very humbling was when we were passing out lunches, we're gathering up trash and putting it in a bag. And they're taking our trash and they're smoothing it out and they're saving the bags and they're saving the peanut butter jars and they're saving all these things that seem like nothing to us. So it was very powerful, very humbling, and I think um, this team has been awesome. We learned so many great things about each other. I learned that Jesus is Lord and we need to live like that. And I don't necessarily know what that looks like, but I know it's much more difficult than it sounds. So thanks for sending us. I think what meant the most to me is looking to see how different San Francisco is, but then trying to figure, like, to try to figure out how can we do this here. Um, City Impact was awesome, and they ministered in so many ways, as you've heard, and I kept thinking, what can we do here? Because you know, around here, you don't walk up to somebody and give them a bag of chips and, and say, you know, hi, I'm Rhonda, I'm from Texas, and we are just wondering if there's something you need prayer about, you know, I mean, you just don't do that. But that's been on my heart more than anything else. And then just the prayer walk that we did was so awesome. I thought, what would it be like if we, you know, like we were talking about praying, you know, doing a prayer walk around the schools, you know, that God would really break barriers and, and just all kinds of things in Jacksonville. You know, the, the thing that was next to us in uh, City Impact was a horrible, 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 horrible place. And, you know, you stand right in front of it and you're, you're praying that, that it would be shut down, you know. And I just thought if we, would, if we would do more with prayer and do more things outside our comfort zone because that was one of the most amazing things for me was to see this group, and I knew everybody, some more than others, but to see everybody step outside their comfort zone on this street ministry. Because at first when we went, it was going to just be certain people. Then they said, okay, y'all are all going to do it. And so some people were just really kind of freaking out inside. And But it was just so cool to think that prayer was so important. Y'all were praying, but it was just so neat to see when you step out of your comfort zone, how God just fills that gap and you do things that you never, never would think that you could do. And it's, I thought too that, you know, we talked about being scared at first, but after a while I was like, you know, we've made friends with a lot of these people and if any of them tried to do something to us, then I think somebody else would have our back, you know, because that's just the kind of area that it is. And I thought that's the way it is here too. And even though there was such a difference between the Tenderloin and the, and the place where the church is going to be that we're helping start, it's that way in Jacksonville here. You know, we have we have two extremes. We have the wealthy and we have the not, and then we have in-betweens. And regardless, people are without hope and they need the Lord. And um, I know that's just that's just really what has affected me more so this time um, on this mission trip was what do we do in Jacksonville now? How does this work? And 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 more boldness that I've not had before. So um, I just want to thank you all for your prayers and and. Um, and even though you may not have gone, you had a part in that by 
with the money that you were able to give, but also through your prayers. And we couldn't have done what we were able to do through Christ without your prayers. So, I'll try to be really brief. Uh, impact for me, what, it, what it's done for me and my family, uh, we got to go on the very last part of it. We fell into the trip, and we thank you again for uh, ascending us. But Chelsea and I have definitely come back with a different perspective. I saw a side of Chelsea that I have never seen before, and I've known her since she was six, off and on. But she, if you know, because she's not even here, partly because of a birth in, in our family, but also because she's not going to speak anyway. Uh, she's going to, I saw a side of her sometimes when I would step back, she would step forward, and that she has grown and, and become more bold. And, and perspective as far as a family, family there being able to speak out boldly, uh, Christ was was amazing. It just, it came, it naturally came, and then it made me think about the family that was created there and the lives that we were able to see, and then coming back here, I didn't know that I had so many surrogate mothers. There's about three or four of them that kept me in line, kept Chelsea in line, uh, but the impact that it had, again, on our marriage and how that reflects Christ, and then also as an individual of how it, it was awkward that it was, could be so bold there, how can we do it back here individually? And uh, as a church family, just a, a call out to go. Uh, we can't express it like James said. It's wow. You, you can't understand, and you probably are tired of hearing us describe it. So you need to be on your own mission trip, whether you go there, whether you go here, because there's opportunities. Make sure that you experience that and, and give to other people so that you can um, be filled up. And you're not seeking. And the, the biggest thing for me perspective-wise, too, was those people had nothing out there. But there was a closeness to God that, that they experienced every day of something, emotionally, spiritually, food-wise. They were given. They were taken care of. And it was neat that we're not hiding behind our jobs or the things that we have, but where our hearts are, you know, where our treasure is, there our heart will be also. And we need to concentrate on those eternal things. To me, it, the, the main thing that stood out to me about this trip was the boldness and how raw it was and how real it was that... All you're doing is supporting people, loving people, and uh, telling them that God loves them. And there, there's so many favorite things I have about this trip, but in, in, in sharing God's love for these people, I got to see, learn more about myself, the flaws that I have, the things that I need work on. And that's really the only, when these mission trip opportunities come up for me, I keep it very simple. If it seems like, if, if the logistics feel like they would work for me, I'm just trying to do better. I'm just trying to get better in my Christian walk. And, and uh, if I can do it through this church, thank God for that. If I can do it in other opportunities, thank God for that. But I just, I just really thank our staff, Steve and Darren and the others, for preparing us as, as best they could for this trip. Um, there's so much more I could say, and, and I, I thank you all for letting us veer off course and do this service this morning, and uh, we are running a little late, but uh, thank you so much for your prayers and your support, because we needed every, every one of them, and uh, thank you. Second Corinthians 5, verse 20 says this, we are therefore Christ's ambassadors. For Christ's love compels us, it won't let us stay where we are. What I want to call you to today, though, is, is a reminder. There's nothing powerful or magical about San Francisco. Uh, there's, it's a special place, and we as a church have decided we're going to invest in that, in that city over the next several years by being a partner in, in a couple of ministries out there. But what makes power isn't going away. It's being used by the Spirit of God. And you don't have to go to California to do that. You can do it right here. And I'm calling you, Central, I'm calling you out and saying it's time for us to do some of these same kind of things right here. To be honest with you, when I was walking through the Tenderloin the first time, I was going, okay, let me think about this for a second. Would I even drive through this area at home? And if I did, how would I do it? Well, I'd start by locking the doors. And then I would drive fast and probably run a light or two just so I could get out of there a little quicker. And ladies and gentlemen, God loves them as much as he loves us. And God loves us as much as he loves them. 
And so let's reach our community the same way we did theirs. Let's love them. Well, how are we going to do it? I don't know, but we'll figure it out. But just like you heard Zach say just a second ago, it starts by loving people where we find them. Not where we wish they were, but where we find them. And that starts on our end. That starts getting our hearts right. So here's our invitation time. Are you ready? Get your heart right. Maybe you're hearing this today and you're going, well, that's fine for them. They're just trying to make celebrities out of these people that went. Nope. They're just servants, just like me. Perhaps the Lord needs to work on your heart. Maybe you need to spend some time talking to the Lord about your heart and get it straight. Maybe you've never invited Christ into your life, and so the idea of going on a mission trip and telling them about Jesus is absolutely beyond your understanding. Meet me right down here in just a moment, and let's get that straight. Perhaps you need to come to this altar and say, God, I'm ready to be used by your Spirit. Here, show me where. Send me to them, Lord. I'm ready to go. If the Lord is speaking to you about making a decision, now's your chance. Let's pray together. Jesus, you came for us knowing we couldn't fix it. We couldn't resolve our spiritual dilemma. We couldn't make it right. We needed you. And so you came, stepping out of eternity, stepping out of heaven. You came to us and fixed it. Took the brokenness of our lives and healed it. Moreover, Lord Jesus, you didn't come to make bad people good. You made dead people alive. And that's what you've done in us. So we come to this place, Lord, and we say we are grateful. Now help us, Lord, to pass that good word along. You've called us, Lord Jesus, as a church to be about a mission of sharing your good news. And Lord, if we don't do it, who will? So I pray you would call us out, Lord, yet again to the mission you've given to us as a church. We offer our hands and our hearts to you and we say, Lord, use us. In this invitation time, Lord, I pray you would deal with hearts, deal with people right where we are and get us right, Lord. Make us pure vessels that we might be used by you. And Lord, if there are people here who need to make a decision for you, Give them strength, conviction, and courage to come down here and make that decision known. We love you, Lord Jesus, and it's in your name we pray. Amen. If the Lord has spoken to you about making a decision and making it public, here's your chance. Stand with me, won't you?